Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Open your Bibles, if you would, to the Second Kings, chapter seven. Since the start of the year, I've been processing. The role of the church. Now, in this past year, we have probably almost doubled in size, which is easy to do if you're small enough. But it got me to thinking, why aren't churches today just packed? Why is it, if we really have the good news, why aren't our churches just filled with overflowing? And so I started looking at what is the church and what is the message of the church. And that's what I want to look at today because I think the church has historically been leaving out the best part of the good news. So that's what we want to look at today. We want to look at two very unlikely passages. Two very unlikely passages. One Old Testament, one New. And these seem to be unrelated passages, and historically they are. But when you see what God is doing in both of these, I think it speaks to where the church needs to be today. So let's begin reading uh, in 2 Kings chapter 7. We're going to read just a few verses, beginning at verse 3. This takes a little bit of a setup because it's an unusual passage. Israel at this time has been split into two kingdoms. The southern kingdom, Judah and most of Benjamin, the northern kingdom. And the northern kingdom was headquartered in Samaria under a very wicked king at this time. So much so that God's judgment comes upon them. The, the Assyrian army surrounds the, the town of Samaria and holds that siege for so long that a huge famine breaks out. And that's where we begin in verse uh, 3. Now there were four men who were lepers at the entrance of the gate, and they said one to another, Why are we sitting here until we die? If we say, Let us enter the city, the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. If we sit here, we die also. So now come, let us go over to the camp of the Syrians. If they spare our lives, we shall live. But if they kill us, I well, will just die. So they arose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when they came to the edge of the camp of the Syrians, behold, there was no one there. For the Lord had made the army of the Syrians hear the sound of chariots and of horses and the sound of a great army, so that they said one to another, Behold, the king of Israel is hired against us, the king of the Hittites, the king of Egypt has come against us, so they fled away in the twilight and abandoned their tents, their horses, their donkeys, leaving the camp as it was, and they fled for their lives. And when these lepers came to the edge of camp, they went into a tent and ate and drank. And they carried off silver and gold and clothing, and they went and hid them, and they came back and entered another tent and carried off the things from it, and went and hid them. Then they said one to another, notice the wording here, they said one to another, we are not doing, what we're doing is not right. This is a day of good news. And if we are silent and wait until morning light, punishment will overtake us. Now therefore come, let us go and tell the king's household. Now if you would, keep your place there, but turn to the New Testament. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 6. We're going to jump around a little bit in this chapter. Chapter 6 begins by Jesus being rejected in his hometown of Nazareth. And then we come to verse 7. And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two. And he gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except the staff. No bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and 
do, and not to put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you, and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and they proclaimed that people should repent, and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and then healed them. Now if you would jump over to verse 30. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while, for many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in a boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. Let me pause here just for a second. How many of you have ever been to the Napa Valley? Okay. Sea of Galilee is roughly the size of the Napa Valley. And around the Sea of Galilee were approximately 30 small villages. So what you're seeing here is they crossed the sea, the people from all these tiny little villages all the way around the outskirts see them coming. And that's what's happening here. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. And when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Love this. Notice. Send them away to go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. And he answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? That's almost a year's wages for the food they were going to need. He said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, five and two fish. He then commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, said a blessing, broke the loaves, and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces of all the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. That ends the reading of God's Word. Thanks be to God. Question this morning, what is the mission of the church? What is the mission of the church? Probably we would answer that in different ways, but I'll bet you in the end it would all come down to evangelism is the mission of the church, right? Our Lord himself said, go therefore and make disciples. So the mission of the church is evangelism. But if the mission of the church is evangelism, what is the message that we are to bring? What is the message we are to bring when we go to share the good news? Well, historically, the church has broken that down into two things. Number one, you're a sinner. Jesus died for sinners. You need Jesus. That's historically been one of the messages of the church. Second message the church brings is Jesus loves you. Both are true statements. Thank God Jesus loves us. Thank God Jesus died for our sins. But I don't think that is the message we're to bring to the world today for two reasons. Number one, you're a sinner, you almost can't sell that today. Because how many people do you know believe they're a sinner? If you don't belong to a church, chances are you don't think you're a sinner. In fact, you think you're in pretty good shape. So that number one's a tough sell today. Number two, Jesus loves you. Well, that's nice. Well, it's good when people like us. But, so what? So what? 
You see why the church has been very ineffective in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ? Because we're giving a message that is perceived to have no impact on our lives today. None whatsoever. Imagine you have a friend in crisis. Perhaps the wife has just heard from the husband. I don't want to be in this marriage anymore. Perhaps the husband has just come home from work and found out that his boss has laid him off. Whatever. Whatever crisis your friend is in, you go to that friend and you say, you know, you're a sinner. You need Jesus. What impact is it going to have on her situation or his situation right there and now? What if you go to them and say, you know, Jesus loves you. What impact does that have on their situation right now? Probably none. Unless the Holy Spirit has been deep at work in their hearts. But now imagine you could go to them in their crisis and, and sit down with them and open the scriptures up with them and show them that they can have the power and presence of God right now in their lives to help them through this situation there. Who would not want that? So that's what we're going to look at today is what is the kingdom of God? And the answer is the kingdom of God is the power and presence of God that is revealed in the life of his children. We have an incredible power within us that is available to the people of God whether they know they've been called yet or not. And we don't do anything with it. We don't do anything with it. In fact, it amazes me. The kingdom of God is the number one topic of the Old Testament. Number one. Every single book in the Old Testament points to and talks about and prophesies towards the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God was the central message of Jesus' ministry. Period. Period. It's the only thing, literally, that he taught about. And yet, how many Christians today can define what is the kingdom of God? If it was the number one message of the Old Testament, if it was the number one message of Jesus' ministry, why isn't it the primary focus of the good news gospel today? That's what these two texts are going to point us to this morning. They're going to teach us about the kingdom of God, the power and presence of God, breaking into human history through his people. Let's take a look, beginning at that first, or excuse me, Second Kings passage. Because it's a great passage. Imagine a family that is so bad that your life is literally in jeopardy. We can't hardly imagine that, right? We pick up our phone, call Domino's, pizza's delivered in 30 minutes or less. We don't understand that kind of poverty. But what we have here is a siege around Samaria that was so long that the people inside the city were literally starving to death. Literally starving to death. Chapter 6 tells us that the head of a donkey was being sold for two pounds of silver. Now, there's not much food on the head of a donkey. It tells us that pigeon dung was being sold for food. And in fact, the siege was so bad that the people, chapter 6 tells us this, the people were starting to eat their children. Imagine the desperation in a siege like this. Now imagine you're a leper in this community. Lepers can't live in the community. Lepers live outside the community, usually near the garbage dump. Because that's where they get their food. And as we come to our text here today, this famine is so severe that there's no food to go to the garbage dumps. And therefore, these lepers have no food. Zero. They can't even pick the garbage up to eat because there is none. So they make a decision. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to go to the camp of our enemy, the Syrians. They're going to kill us for sure. Number one, they don't like lepers any more than the Israelites do. And number two, we're their enemy. They're going to kill us for sure. But on the odd chance they don't, maybe they'll feed us. 
So if we go there and die, what's the big deal? Because we're definitely going to die if we stay here. You see the desperation of these lepers now as they head to the camp of their enemy. So they go. They go to the camp of their enemy. And what do they find? They go there expecting death. What they find are the treasures of God poured into their life. More food than you can imagine. Now keep in mind, they don't eat off plates. They eat out of the garbage dump. Here's food fit for an army and enough to feed the army. And they've got it all. There's the silver, there's the gold, there's the horses, there's the donkeys. The text spells it all out. There's more wealth here than they could ever imagine. They've gone from being the outcasts of Israel to one of the wealthiest people in all of Israel. You say, yeah, but that's not really theirs. Uh, actually, yeah, it was. Jewish law says if there was anything found outside of the threshold of a house, it belonged to the person who found it. Finders keepers was a Jewish law. This wealth belonged entirely to them. So if you were them, you would do what they did, I'm sure. They started hoarding it until they realized what they were doing. And then look what the text says. Then they said one to another, we're not doing right. This was a day of good news. And so they went and told the king's household, Good news. What happened when they shared the good news? Hex doesn't tell us, but you can imagine. The desperation of that people in that city was so great that these two lepers lost everything they were entitled to. There's no way the people in that town were going to go to that camp and say, well, it belongs to you. They were eating their children. They were so hungry. They went and ravaged that camp. So you see what these lepers did? They gave up everything they were entitled to. Everything they were entitled to. In order to share the good news. Why? They said it themselves. The news is too good. We have to share it. Now, this text really challenges me on several levels. How much are you and I willing to give up our entitlements to share the good news? You think about it. I worked hard all my life. I can spend my money the way I want. I worked hard for many, many years. I'm retired. I can do whatever I want. Those are entitlements we have. And we hang on to these entitlements, right? We expect a life that's fair. We're entitled to that. We're a people of entitlement. I didn't bring my cell phone here today, but if any of you have uh, one of these smartphones, if you look at the bottom of the smartphone, there's a little button. And if you hold your thumb over that button, it reads your thumbprint and unlocks the phone. It's a handy little safety device. Just before Christmas, I read a story of a six-year-old girl who got up one morning, this was last December, and she saw her mother's smartphone laying on the counter. So she takes her mother's smartphone and she sneaks into the bedroom. She pulls her mother's hand up gently, lays her mother's thumb on that button, and unlocks her mother's smartphone. I don't know why the mother never woke up, but she did. Now imagine the mother's surprise when she got up a little while later and checked her email and found six messages from Amazon.com confirming over $250 worth of toys that she had ordered that morning. <laughs> and when the little girl was finally confronted about it, they said, why did you do this? And she said, very unrepentantly, I wanted the toys. She felt if she wanted it, she was entitled to it. No repentance there at all. And we laugh at that, but you know what? I think we all have that to a much larger degree. 
We look at our lives and there are certain things we say we're entitled to. I open up my checkbook and I look at it. And I see how I spend my money. And I look at my calendar and I see how I spend my time. And I think about what my priorities are and I have to ask myself, do all of these things reflect an attitude of entitlement? Or do they display an excitement to share the good news? I think that's what we see here in this text. If we believe the Old and the New Testament are connected in the Holy Canon of Scripture, which I certainly do, then you have to believe that the writing in the text here is intentional. This is a day of good news. What were they saying there? This is the day of gospel. So let's go to the New Testament. And let's take a look at that passage in Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6 is a fascinating passage. It's an incredible passage. Here we see several things happening. We see Jesus being rejected in Nazareth. Now what you need to understand about this text is we're nearing the end, even though we're only in Mark 6, we're nearing the end of the second year of Jesus' ministry. Something pivotal happens at the end of the second year of Jesus' ministry. He no longer goes and teaches to Israel. In fact, just the opposite. He begins to teach in parables so that many in Israel cannot understand so that's right where we're at. We're just at the end of the second year of ministry. And then we see the disciples going out. He sends them out, 12 disciples, two by two, and he sends them out with three directives. He gives them authority to cast out demons. He gives them authority to heal the sick. And he gives them authority to preach the good news. Three things. And he sends them out. Matthew tells us, he gives them this additional instruction, do not go to any Gentile. Go only to the people of Israel. And he sends the disciples out two by two to the people of Israel. I was wondering about that two by two, what the significance of that was. I think that's just Jesus understanding how insecure the disciples were here. This is the first time he's sending them out on their own. <coughs> So he says, take a friend along and go out two by two. But I think it's very important, the fact that they make note here in the text that he sent out all 12. And he sent them only to the people of Israel. I think that's highly symbolic of the new kingdom witnessing to the old. Jesus is about to turn off his ministry to the Jewish nation. And he's starting to turn his ministry only to the Gentile people. And I think this is the last volley shot across the bow of the boat, giving Israel one last chance to repent. Because the kingdom of God is about to explode on the scene. And that's what we see here in this text. We, we see the 12 disciples going out and issuing a single decree. Think about it. What did they teach? Jesus died for you on the cross. No, because he hadn't done that yet. In fact, they had no idea it was coming. So what was the message they were proclaiming? The text tells us, the text uses one word, repent, which was the message Jesus always gave to the Jewish nation. Interesting, he rarely used it in speaking to Gentiles, but to the Jewish nation he did frequently. He says, repent. Now, why repent? For one reason, the kingdom of God is here. How do we know that from the text? Because Jesus gave him authority to do three things. Heal the sick, cast out demons, preach the good news. Those are the three indicators every Jewish person was looking for as a sign that the kingdom of God had come in the person of Messiah. Old Testament passages prophesy that when Messiah comes, he will heal the sick, he will cast out demons, he will deliver the good news of the kingdom. What the disciples are proclaiming to Old Testament Israel here is that the kingdom of God has arrived. It has arrived on the scene. The power of God 
is about to break into human history in the person of Messiah. And that's what the disciples are declaring. And they come back now. And Jesus wants to see if they understand the message they've been bringing. Look at verse 30. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. Okay, the disciples all of a sudden get this burst of popularity. It's like they go out, they start doing the things Jesus did, and people start thronging to them to the point to where they were overwhelmed. Now, we don't know how long they were gone. A couple days, a week, a month. Text doesn't tell us. But when they come back, they're exhausted. So Jesus says, you know what? You deserve a time away of rest. You deserve a time away from rest. So they get in the boat, they go to the other side, and you can imagine the disciples as they're rowing up to the shore, and there's this massive crowd of people. I'm sure the, the phraseology may have been different, but the message had to have been, oh, crap. <laughs> That's the last thing the disciples wanted to see was a bunch of people. They were exhausted. They were people out. Pastor friend of mine said the perfect church would have a door in the back. And I noticed you have one. So he says, I can preach to people who walk out the back door and never have to talk to anybody. <laughs> I think that's the way the disciples felt. I think that's exactly the way the disciples felt. But Jesus responds first. And notice what the text says. He had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. That's an interesting phrase because it's an Old Testament phrase. Zechariah in particular with some of the Old Testament prophets prophesied about a day that was coming when Israel would be lost like sheep without shepherds. It was a foretelling of the coming Messiah when he would come as their shepherd. And Jesus sees these people and he says they're lost. But what's interesting here is their king has compassion on them. But the disciples respond a different way. Look at verse 36. Send them away. Right? We were expecting time alone with you, Jesus. We're tired. We don't really want to bless them. We really don't want to minister to them. We don't even want to share your time. We just want to be alone with you. Send them away. And Jesus responds here by telling them, you give them something to eat. What's he doing here? He's teasing them. No, I don't think so. He's taunting them. I don't think so. He's testing them. You give them something to eat. Now, how is that a test? Where did the disciples just come from? They came from preaching the countryside. Casting out demons, healing the sick, preaching the good news that the kingdom of God is about ready to burst onto the scene. And Jesus is asking the disciples here, do you understand the message you've been preaching? Or do you believe the message you've been preaching? If you believe that the power and presence of God is here today, ready to burst into human history, then you feed them. And if you're wondering, the disciples didn't get it. They said, we're going to need almost a year's worth of wages to buy this much food. Understand, the text tells us there were 5,000 men there, plus women and children. Most likely, there were over 10,000 people here. And so Jesus tells them, collect up the five loaves and two fishes and go feed everybody. And as amazing a miracle as that is, this has nothing to do with feeding people. People have often taken this text and said, why is there poverty in the world? God can do this. But this isn't a text about feeding people. This is a text quizzing the disciples to understand that the kingdom of God is here. And to make sure the disciples get that, he does something interesting after he feeds all these people. He tells the disciples, go pick up the pieces. That's kind of a strange thing to ask. I mean, if you and I are picking it together and we're having some fish and bread up on a hillside and we're done and there's a little left over, what are you going to do with it? 
I'm going to leave it right there in the ground. Birds will clean it up in a few minutes. And I suspect that's what they would have done. I'm sure it's what the disciples wanted to do. But the text tells us that Jesus says, no, you go pick it up. And when they picked up the leftovers, right? I mean, first of all, the disciples must have been thinking, not going to be any leftovers. But they go and there are 12 baskets full. One for each disciple. Can you imagine the disciples who had just been proclaiming that the power and presence of God is about to break into the world, had just seen a visual demonstration of what the kingdom of God looks like, and that each one of them stand here staring at this basket of leftover food. And they must have started to understand what the power and presence of God in the lives of the people of God is all about. But just like those lepers who had to give up what they were entitled to, this cost the disciples something as well. They had to give up their inconveniences in order to see the power of God at work. I think you and I have to be challenged a little bit by that today as well. We don't like to be inconvenienced, even if it's for ministry. We think we have a right to be comfortable, not to be inconvenienced. And yet the text clearly says that sometimes in order to see the power and presence of God break into human history, we have to be inconvenienced by it. I'll tell you a cute little story. It'd be cute if it wasn't so embarrassing. When Laura and I first moved to Napa, uh, we went to pick up some plants from a local nursery so we could start putting shrubs around the house we had just bought. And we pick up the shrubs. I'm loading them in the back of the truck. I hop into the truck, and there's my wife standing in front of the pickup talking to someone. And I'm thinking, I've got all of these plants to plant today. I've got to get home. I've got a lot to do. So I'm getting impatient. Come on. If you don't know my wife, she can talk to anybody at any time, anywhere. And I'm thinking, cut it off, or cut it off. Let's go. Let's go. And I, I think, I'm not sure to confirm with her, I think at some point I tapped the horn. She gets in the truck. I said, what in the world are you doing? We've got to get home. We've got to get these plants planted. She said, I was inviting this lady to church. 30 years later, that lady still comes to our church. I would have missed seeing the power of God work in the life of an individual because of my inconvenience. We have to look at ourselves today, people. The good news of the gospel is not just about Jesus Christ dying for me. Because if that's what it's all about, you've given me no reason to make a decision today for him. I don't plan on dying today. And that only does me some good when I need to go to heaven. So I'm going to be like that thief on the cross. I'm going to wait till the end. And then I'll choose Jesus. But the message of the church today has to be that the kingdom of God is broken into this world in power and presence through the people of God. We have to set aside our entitlements. We have to set aside our inconveniences. And we have to bring the power and presence of God to the people in our community. That's what the gospel is all about. We have unlimited power available to us to carry out the work of God. What did the lepers accomplish? The salvation of God's people. What did Jesus accomplish by feeding this 5,000? He opened the eyes of the disciples to the power and presence of God in the world today. Now, what is the mission of the church? Evangelism. What is the message? That God's people have the power and presence of God Almighty Himself available to them to work through any circumstance that life may throw at us. Now, I don't expect to go out of here today and cast out a demon. Don't expect to heal anybody. But 
But I do leave here today with great expectation that the power and presence of God is going to flow through me in this week to bring about the salvation of one of his people. That's the message we have to bring to our communities. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we come to you today completely repentant that we are so reluctant to give up the things we feel entitled to and we're so reluctant to be inconvenienced, Lord, even by you. Oh, we say we want to serve and we say we believe. If it's convenient, if it doesn't cost me anything, the Lord, I pray that today every one of us would see that the news is so great that we just have to share it. That we're like these lepers saying it's not right that we keep the good news to ourselves. Because the power and presence of God is available to the people of God to share the love of God. Lord, make us faithful. I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. If you would, stand for God's parting blessing. It's been great to be back here with you today. It's been a long time. Uh, we were trying to guess, but I think it's probably been six or seven years since we've been here. But great to be back. Thanks for inviting us. As you go now, understand that when God brings his kingdom into the world, he doesn't just hand it to you and walk away. He goes with you. And he goes before you, and he sends you with his blessing. And the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and fill you with his peace now and forevermore. Amen. Right here, I have the scripts for you to read the scriptures and stuff. So, yes.